Welcome to Chasing Truth, a show produced for those who love and deeply value the truth. Thanks for joining me today. We're in part two of a series addressing the question, did Sunday in the first century replace Saturday as the new weekly day of worship? The most often cited texts to prove this assumption are 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. We did a show on that previous to this. Also, Acts 20, verses 7 through 12, and then finally, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. Keep in mind that these are the three most often cited New Testament passages, celebrated texts, in proving the assumption that Sunday in the first century replaced Saturday as the new Sabbath for Christians. Now, let's challenge these assumptions. Let's look and see if this is true. Let's begin with Acts chapter 20, verses 7 through 12. I'm just going to read it through first, then we'll unpack it. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together, and there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep. And as Paul kept talking, he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and fell upon him, and after embracing him, he said, Do not be troubled, for his life is in him. When he gone, had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he talked with them a long while until daybreak and then left. They took away the boy alive, and they were greatly comforted. Now, the assumption is that this is solid evidence that the early Jewish and Gentile believers were meeting and taking communion every week on Sunday as the new Christian Sabbath, which by this time had already replaced the seventh day Sabbath of the Ten Commandments. True? Well, let's look at it closer. It says, on the first day of the week. This is Jewish lingo for what we today would call Sunday. That's, that's code for Sunday. And in Jewish time reckoning, the day always begins on the prior evening. The prior evening. So in this case, it would correspond to Saturday evening after sunset. Now, a number of scholars try to put this on Sunday evening. They try to say that, that Luke is using kind of a Roman time scheme in terms of what he is trying to get across. Now, I want you to think about this. If that's true, if it's Sunday evening, uh, keep, keep in mind that Paul then would be breaking bread, i.e. taking communion. They all would be gathered for their Sunday meeting to take communion at well past midnight Sunday evening, which then puts it on Monday rather than Sunday. That's a problem. It's really absurd when you think about it. Unless, of course, you want to try to move Sunday to Monday and make Monday the new day for the weekly service. Now, we think that uh, Luke is using a Jewish time reckoning scheme, just as he does over and over and over again throughout his gospel. Therefore, we believe the weight of evidence supports this time as Saturday evening. It's a Saturday evening gathering after sunset. In fact, they're going to share a meal and say goodbye to the Apostle Paul as he continues on his missionary journey to his next location. Saturday evening after sunset would be called the first day of the week by all Jews everywhere in Israel in the first century. It goes on to say, when we were to, uh, gathered together to break bread. The assumption is this phrase is the technical term for, for what is later called Eucharist or Holy Communion. Is that true? I mean, look it up. It's, it's, it's just simply not the case. In fact, the phrase breaking bread was the, was the common expression within uh, the Jewish culture of the day to refer to a common meal. Breaking bread was, was in reference to eating a meal together. In other words, they were gathered together for a common meal. Nowhere in the Bible, nor in the Jewish literature of the day, is this phrase used as a technical term for what later is understood as Holy Communion or Eucharist. Note there's no mention of a cup of wine. There's no mention of any liturgy or special prayers. No blessing of the supposed bread and wine. Let's go on. Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. 
this this is fascinating because it's a Saturday night gathering. They have a meal. They're going to say goodbye. But he has to talk and talk and talk. And then, then he prolongs it. It's going to go past midnight. That's that's Paul, right? That's that's Paul the Apostle. No surprise there. It's, it's after midnight that Eutychus falls from the window and dies. And then Paul revives him. So it's after midnight, well into... Uh, the 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 after midnight hours that Paul then goes back up and he breaks the bread and eats. He eats. He talk, then talks to them a long while until daybreak and then left. Notice the grammar. The, the verbs are in the singular. In other words, it's Paul who's doing the talking. It's Paul who's breaking the bread. It's Paul who's eating. And then Paul leaves at daybreak. This is amazing when you spend some time and unpack the passage. So, in conclusion, Acts 20, 7 through 12 is the recounting of Paul's missionary trip it, it recounts his farewell gathering late on a Saturday night. He eats his meal well after midnight and leaves to continue his missionary pursuits very early on Sunday morning at daybreak. It is ludicrous to try and read into this passage that Paul is establishing a new weekly day of worship to replace the Lord's Sabbath. There's no mention of the supposed technical term for Sunday, i.e. Lord's Day, but rather the phrase, the first day of the week. Why? Because it's a common day. It's not a holy day. It's not a Sabbath. It is a common day. The holy weekly day is the Sabbath. Notice there's no communion service mentioned, no wine mentioned, no blessing over the bread and the wine, no liturgy mentioned. In fact, the whole argument that this is a new weekly Christian Sabbath replete with communion that has replaced the Lord's Sabbath is based entirely on silence and ignores the immediate context of Paul's missionary endeavors. People of God, we need to quit being so gullible. We're required to check things out for ourselves. Frankly, I think this is laughable. In the end, the second most often referenced and celebrated verse for trying to prove that Sunday replaced the Lord's Sabbath falls on the same trash heap of isogesis as did the interpretation of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 3 that we already looked at. So on our next show, we're going to take a closer look also at the last most often and celebrated passage that allegedly proves the Sunday replaced the Lord's Sabbath in the first century as the new weekly day of corporate worship. That's going to be a revelation. I believe, I believe it is. Let me just check. Revelation 1 and verse 10. So again, thanks for joining me today on this show. Uh, if you have a chance, please subscribe to this channel, comment below, and check out all of our social media sites at graftedin.com. Graftedin.com. Thanks. You want to redo the ending? Yeah. Or we can skip it. No, we okay. just redo the ending real okay. quick. Take it. Okay. Take two. In our next show, we will take a closer look at the most often cited. Take three. In our next show, we will take a closer look at the last most often cited passage that allegedly proves that Sunday replaced the Lord's Sabbath in the first century as the new weekly day of corporate worship. It's Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. You're not going to want to miss this. So again, thanks for joining me today and Chasing Truth on this passionate matter. And please subscribe to this channel, comment below. And if you have a chance, check out all of our social media sites at graftedin.com. Thanks. Mm -hmm.